Okay, AP Human Geo, we're going to be talking about development today. This is the beginning of our development PowerPoint. We're going to start out talking about commodity chains. This is something that you guys went or would have read about in your field notes in this unit's reading guide. Part of development is understanding economies and commodity chains. A commodity chain is a process used by firms to gather resources, transform them into goods or commodities, and finally distribute them to consumers. It's a series of links connecting the many places of production and distribution and resulting in a commodity that is then exchanged on the world market. So guys, a commodity chain goes into every aspect of production of a good. So if we think about your iPad, I mean, think about how many different materials are involved just in your iPad. So the glass, the different metals that are needed to make the memory and the internal components is part of the commodity chain. All the way to when that piece of technology makes it to the Apple Store. And this doesn't even, doesn't even have to be for something as complicated as an iPad. It could be an example. Uh, you could use bananas have different commodity chains. Clothing has different commodity, commodity chains. It's a good way to think about it is um, a connected path from which goods travel from producers to consumers. Each commodity chain is unique by each product type, right? So obviously where we get bananas is going to be very different. The commodity chain that bananas come from are very different than where iPads come from. Different stages can involve different economic sectors absolutely to come together for one final product. What we're going to look at now are economic indicators within different um, that we use to basically decide how developed a country is. We kind of look at their economies and get a baseline idea of basically if, if this would be considered a core or a periphery country. We're going to look at the first two economic indicators at once and then we're going to kind of compare and contrast them. The first would be gross national product, the GNP. This is a measure of the total value of the officially recorded goods and services produced by the citizens and corporations of a country in a given year. This takes into account things that are in and outside of the United States. So these are these are products and money that is generated from us and from United States companies abroad. Now, a little bit different than that is GDP, goods and services produced within a country during a given year. I'm going to give you an example to kind of try to help you understand these two economic indicators because they're, they sound similar. Let's say that Ford, which is an American company, has a uh, manufacturing plant in the United Kingdom somewhere. And they sell $50 million worth, they profit $50 million worth of um, money in the UK. That money would be factored into our GNP because it's in and outside of the United States. But that, fi that $50 million would not be in our GDP because it wasn't produced specifically within the country. That would, however, be in the United Kingdom's GDP. If that I hope that kind of helps you understand. So if it's produced within a country, and that the GDP would would encapsulate that. But since it's an American company, it would be in our GNP. The last one, which is being which is the newest of the economic indicators, would be the gross gross national income, which is monetary worth of what is produced within a country plus income received from investments outside of the country. So really the big difference there would be kind of investments and, and um, taxing kind of issue for gross national income. Now if we look at a little bit more about how we kind of use money as a classification, GNI only accounts for the formal economy. All right, so the formal economy would be things considered legal economy that governments tax and monitor. Okay, so the formal economy in the United States is very large. That would be any time that you go to a restaurant or to a store and you're charged tax, that is part of the formal economy. Some countries only have a GNI of 1,000 per capita, though. How can people survive? How does that work? Well, the reason is, is that in a lot of developing countries, they have a very large informal economy, the illegal or uncounted economy that governments do not tax and keep track of including tomatoes from your garden or the, to the black market for internal organs. Now, that sounds pretty intense, but that's true. So in the United States, if you, let's say, you shovel your neighbor's sidewalk 
or cut their grass and they just pay you in cash and you they don't take out tax for that, that would be considered the informal economy. On an extreme level, on an extreme level, the black market, I, you guys have probably heard of that term, would be another example of the informal economy. Um, the there's a huge so in the United States, if you let's say you needed a kidney, um, you would go on a transplant waiting list. In other countries, that doesn't not all countries does that exist. So there's this huge black market for internal organs in a lot of developing countries, which is actually really quite sad. But what happens is sometimes you see people are actually killed and their internal organs are harvested, for lack of a better term, and then sold on the black market. Obviously, that is not part of the formal economy, and people who have a lot of money will often pay cash on the black market for those things. So the informal economy is very large in a lot of developing countries because the government just does not keep, doesn't have the, the scope to keep track of all of the all of the different um, transactions that are taking place. So the informal economy is huge in a lot of developing countries and it's often just exchanges of cash between different groups of people. All right, so why economic indicators aren't perfect? Well, you can't, there's no catch-all for anything, guys, really, and especially in AP Human Geography. I think we've kind of come to that conclusion as well. These economic indicators that we talked about mask the extremes in the distribution of wealth within a country. So it doesn't show that, sure, maybe there is, it's, I mean, even within the United States, you guys have heard the reference to the 1%, right? Well, that 1% makes significantly more money than a lot, than the, the majority of the rest of the population. However, they're going to skew the average, right? And that, all, that is exactly what happens in a lot of other countries around the world, too. The United States is not unique in that sense that the distribution of wealth is not even, it's not, it's not divided evenly among its citizens. There are a few very, very rich, and then the majority of them are poor, but because of those few rich, it's making it seem like, oh, well, the, the GNI of, of, let's, you know, country A is $38,000. Well, no, maybe five people make significant amounts of money and the rest of people are living in poverty. GNI also only measures outputs of production. It doesn't take into account the cost of production. So this would be considering um, any kind of resource depletion. So this would be the idea that maybe um, there's a country is a large lumber producer. However, they're cutting down their natural resources of their forests and trees, and that doesn't take in. So that is a huge problem, right? Or the depletion of oil reserves or natural gas reserves. So it only measures the outputs. It doesn't take into the effect that there's actually environmental degradation that's potentially happening while this is taking place as well. And that is where we're going to end this flipped classroom.